Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. And happy Trinity Sunday. This Sunday provides for us some rather unusual scripture passages. So if you would join me uh, before we look at our Old Testament lesson for this morning, please join me in prayer. Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Still any voice within us but your own. That as we come before your throne and listen to your word this day, we might catch a glimpse of who you are. And in you might see some of who we are. That we might learn who you desire us to be in this world. And might serve you well even as we look with glorious anticipation towards the next. And now may the words of our mouths and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our Old Testament lesson this morning comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. Now, remember that Isaiah is actually a very long book, and it includes a whole lot of different things. And the passage that we're going to read this morning is a bit apocalyptic. So listen now to Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings, With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So over the course of the two years that I spent with my very first youth group in Nashville, We did a confirmation curriculum that covered not only the Bible, but also history, theology, and polity. Basically, everything that I wish I had at least heard about before I left for college. And one day, we were discussing the expansion of Christianity that occurred in Europe during the early Middle Ages. We were looking at how often the Catholic Church used the native religions of the peoples they were trying to convert to explain major concepts to them. This form of appropriation helped them to gain a whole bunch of converts and was used around the globe in various ways. That day in particular, we were specifically looking at how they used the Norse trinity, Odin, the All-Father, Thor, the son who was destined to save the world, and Freya, the goddess of love, in order to explain the concept of the Christian trinity to the peoples of the North. To which one of my youth, after thinking about it for a while, responded, So Jesus is Thor, right? Actually, yeah, that was pretty accurate. My friends, it is Trinity Sunday, and it is that one day in the year in the liturgical calendar when pastors all over the country and really the world attempt to explain one of the great mysteries of Christian theology to their churches in a way that everyone might actually understand. Right. (laughs) The doctrine of the Trinity, it dates back to the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, when the leaders of the early church were fighting off heretics who suggested that either there were two gods, the Creator and Jesus, or that Jesus was not actually God. 
So the theologians at the council came up with this concept that has been stumping followers of Christ ever since. But contrary to popular, well, relatively popular assumption, they did not pull this theory out of thin air. Throughout the scriptures, including the Hebrew Bible, there are references to God's ability and choice to work in more than one form. We all remember the story of Abraham and Sarah being visited by a traveling party of three persons to predict the arrival of Isaac. Remember that story when Sarah laughs at the prediction? The scriptures say that that traveling party was actually God. I could take some time to try to explain how the Trinity is expressly visible in the creation story, but that would probably take over the sermon and take a really long time. So if you ever really want to know about that, please feel free to contact me outside of right this second. And we know that Jesus refers not only to God, the Creator Father, but also to the Holy Spirit who will come and to himself as the Son of God. Believe it or not, this passage from Isaiah and other passages from Revelation are yet other examples used by scholars to identify God's Trinitarian form and explained the first hymn that we actually use this morning, Holy, Holy, Holy. But if we speak only of the Trinitarian nature of God, we would not give this passage that we just read its proper due in its own right. This is a call story central to the history of Israel. Isaiah and his successors, they spoke God's messages through some of the most devastating periods in the history of God's people. The year that King Uzziah died was in the 8th century before the Common Era. He died because though he brought the kingdom to great prosperity, he forgot to worship God anymore. So none of his people did either. That did not end well for him. Then his son made this disastrous alliance with Syria that led to the Assyrians sacking Israel within two generations, eventually leading to the Babylonians sacking Assyria and the remnant of Israel left there, and it turned into this whole big mess. But back at the beginning, before everything went to chaos, Isaiah, the representative of God's children living in the kingdom of Judah, finds himself witnessing a heavenly vision that mirrors the temple in Jerusalem. Upon seeing this awesome and terrifying sight, he realizes that he is completely out of his depth. Technically, seeing this, he should be dead. He represents a people who have been giving God lip service. They have been misrepresenting the state of their world to further their own purposes, And he, as a member of that group, is implicitly responsible. So he cries, woe is me. To be in the presence of something that holy not only brings us to our knees, but it opens our eyes to whatever else is haunting our relationship with God. So one of the angels of fire, that's what seraphim means, comes with a burning coal from the holy flames to purge his lips. Now, this is a scene that should bring us back, at least us, Christians, to baptismal imagery. Remember, we are baptized not only with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Once he has confessed his own part in the world's sin, he is forgiven. He is then purified, not so that he can sit pretty and feel good about himself, No, the work has only just begun for this representative of the people. God knows that the message needs to get out. So God asks the question to which the young prophet responds, Here I am. Send me. How do we respond to God's holy claim upon our lives? Heavenly visions are rare these days. Sin is an ever-present reality in our midst, as it has been for generations, millennia of humans before us, yet God still asks, whom shall I send? Now, many of you may have noticed that I have this huge wall of crosses that sit behind my desk. It sits behind my desk in my office. 
and some of them have more or less significance. But there is one that has the most. It is, in fact, the smallest one uh, right in the center. It was given to me by one of my mentors as a gift for my ordination. The cross was actually a gift to her from a friend that she met through her work in Habitat for Humanity. The man who originally owned the cross came to our shores with a very strong German accent. After witnessing the atrocities of the Holocaust, he spent the remainder of his life here serving humanity, serving God, begging for forgiveness for his own responsibility in the horrors that occurred. He had not been an officer or a war criminal as such. Nevertheless, there was still so much that he felt he could have done to resist and to fight the devastating, hate-filled powers that had taken over his home country all those years ago. And so answering the call on his life meant leaving all he had ever known behind in order to seek redemption through a humble life of grace-filled labor. And this cross, one of the few things he brought with him from the old country, it bears upon it the image of the three visitors to Abraham and Sarah a constant reminder of God's presence and call upon us to community, a vision of our responsibility to one another. Because, my friends, God calls to all of us, not only in loud visions or cataclysmic lightning bolts, but far more often through silence, the silence of God's presence in our hurting world. The silence of those words left unsaid and deeds left undone. The silence of those who have had their voices taken from them. The call will be to small or great things, and it will look different for each of us. Yet there is an essential thing that each version of this call will have in common. You know, several years ago, I carved a trinity knot into a pumpkin on Halloween and posted a picture on Facebook with the caption, 100 Jesus points to who, whoever can tell me what this is. Now, Jesus points are like brownie points, but they get you a better place in heaven. And yes, they were just a running joke in this, my second youth group. And there were several guesses that night, but no one actually identified it as a trinity knot, much to my sadness. However, young, one young woman did identify the knot as the Imago Dei. Somehow, in teaching the doctrine of the Trinity every week the year before, its image got tied up with another lesson, what it means to be made in the image of God. That is what she had kept with her. And frankly, I could not have been any more proud. The thing that all of our callings will bear in common is that they will bear the mark of God's own image. We are made in the image of the God that is one but acts through three persons, the lover, the beloved, and the love that unites them. We are made in the image of perfect love and community and relationship so that God might have even more love and community and relationship. We are made to be loved and to love, to serve, to share, to walk together. Sometimes our call will be to speak harsh truths to those in power like Isaiah did and others have throughout history. Other times we will be called to share hugs and embraces of compassion with those who are in desperate need of them. Sometimes in trouble and in hospitals and in hospices and especially now as we are all moving towards having our vaccinations, we can do that again. And still there are other times when we will be called to serve in gratitude for forgiveness that by all rights never should be ours. The call will come in a myriad of ways because you and I are made in the image of our triune God. And it is that holy, holy, holy who still begs the question of us, whom shall I send into the world in pain? into the hurting hot mess, into the fear and to face the hatred. 
So my friends, what will be your answer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.